The UNEP Sasakawa Prize is one of the world's most important environmental awards. In today's program, we feature two of its laureates. One is a former UN official who quit his high-paying job to go back to his country to provide money-making solutions for the poor. Another is a scientist who was part of a team that first detected a threat to the ozone layer. Beijing. When the Sasakawa Prize was established, bicycles were the main form of transport here. Now, to get to their destination on time, the laureates must get police passage through the gridlock. There's growing alarm in Chinese government circles at the horrendous environmental cost of its economic boom. Hosting the 20th anniversary is an important opportunity to focus attention on green issues and the need to tackle shared problems. It's a keystone of the prize. My father always had the belief that the world is a family, one big family. All mankind are brothers and sisters. In fact, he started to say this in 1939. He wrote this in his diary as far back as that. He also said that if you look at our Earth from the universe, we can see a very beautiful planet. No borders, no people fighting, a very beautiful planet. So we must protect it and preserve it. The annual Sasakawa Award of $200,000 makes it one of the world's most valuable environmental prizes. It's backed by the Nippon Foundation, which spends $650 million a year on good causes. The prize was established in 1984 funded by the Nippon Foundation. Thank you very much. Among the laureates invited to China were Ian Kiernan, winner in 1998, an Australian yachtsman who founded the Clean Up the World campaign in 1993. It's estimated that 150 million have participated in the campaign. Huey Johnson won in 2001 for his work both in NGOs and in local government, promoting the management of natural resources in the state of California. Husband and wife Wolfgang and Françoise Verhenna were joint winners in 1991 for their work in framing international environmental law. Changing mindsets and empowering the poor is what drives Ashok Kosla, winner of the award in 2002, for his work in India providing practical money-making solutions for the poor and needy of his country. He was born in Lahore, an ancient city located in Punjab, which was then in India, but has subsequently become Pakistan. No, I don't think I would say I was uh, born an environmentalist. No, actually, I was a refugee. I had to move out of Srinagar and Kashmir at about an hour's notice when the um, Pakistan army attacked uh, Kashmir. So in 1947, uh, the lights went out, people shouted from the streets, you better get out of here. And we packed a suit, a, a, an attached case, and left. How far? Come back to Dalek. When I was about eight, my father, after a year after independence, uh, was offered a job in the diplomatic service. So he went off to the High Commission in London, took us with him. And uh, we lived in Europe uh, after that for many, many years, and in North America and other places. So until I was uh, 31, I basically was overseas. Uh, my childhood started uh, in India, but I spent all my years after the age of eight uh, abroad. Ashok Kosla returned to India aged 31, giving up a highly paid job as an international civil servant. 
Today, much of his time is spent travelling between his home in New Delhi to Jhansi in the north of the country, now the headquarters of Development Alternatives, a non-profit organisation he established in 1983. DA creates practical business systems that poor communities can use to make modest profits. This environmentally friendly papermaking unit on site at DA's headquarters makes the paper from cotton waste. It's used for both research purposes, but also as a demonstration unit to show how the business model works. It's the business itself that is sold on. Every money-making framework DA creates is environmentally friendly. The environment became very important to me because it was really a synthesizing concept which brought together many of the issues that I was very concerned about. Uh, concerned about poverty, concerned about the massive degradation of our landscapes, our forests, our soils, our rivers. I was deeply concerned about the fact that uh, countries like India, poor countries like India, were not making sufficient progress towards eradicating poverty. Development Alternatives' most successful initiative is the making of micro-concrete roofing tiles made out of quarry waste. This is the micro-concrete roofing tile unit. We make standardized roofing material which is being sold all over the country. 800 enterprises are now using it profitably. Uh, it's the solution to the housing problem of India. Around India, these tiles are used on over 400,000 houses. Here in the nearby village of Azadpura, houses are built solely using DA products. And the word environment, in a sense, is the only way to describe the whole problem. And for me, environment was not furry animals alone. It wasn't a question of getting rid of pollution alone. It was a question of designing uh, social development and economic development in such a way that these problems didn't exist, didn't occur in the first place. DA is also involved in developing marketable technologies to conserve water in rural India. It's designed and built a series of check dams like this one, Gurati Dam. Kosla maintains small dams replenish groundwater reserves and wells in remote areas. He says these mini dams are transforming the fortunes of communities. It was this kind of creative thinking and problem solving that caught the attention of the Sasakawa Prize organizers. It seemed to me from my studies uh, and my observations around the world that development happened because it was in the interest of people to make it happen. So I had learned very early in the game to think about development as a process of facilitating uh, entrepreneurship, of uh, productive capacities, of getting poor countries to rethink uh, how they use their resources better. And so, in a sense, by the time I was about 25, I had already, in my mind, designed what I wanted to do, which was innovation like IBM and delivery like McDonald's. Please tell me, this particular dam, how much money is coming back to these farmers? My bet is that if they went to the bank and invested this money in a dam, they would get the whole money back within a month. I mean, no business can give you that kind of money, you know? Farmers in this region, like Balkrishan, say Ashok Kosler has given them opportunities they would otherwise never have had. Bob Christian basically says that uh, the amount of uh, improvement in their lives has been huge. Uh, since the dam was built 10 years ago, they have been able to plant two and sometimes more crops a year than they used to before. In addition, of course, their wells have uh, got water in them. They come and swim here. 
they've been able to get additional improvements in their lives with all the greenery and all the additional life around, which has made a great difference in their lives. Today, farmers like Balkrishan say they get a harvest from land that was, until the construction of the dam, dry and barren. This is millet. And mustard. Or yaha. This is ginger. Or It is uh, various kinds of spices. He says that uh, since the Czech dam, this has all become possible. Before that, they were not able to grow these things. Uh, the reason is that the water table has come up, and because of that, it has essentially made possible crops that need a fair amount of water. Uh, the number of uh, projects of this type are far fewer than there should be. The dramatic improvements in life that you get from a little project like this, a mere 10,000 pounds worth of investment, actually creates every year uh, 10 times as much income uh, in the area surrounding. Elsewhere in the Chadwari village, Kostla is greeted by 126 women who've joined together and been able to afford to build a cow shed and buy some cows communally. They also hope to develop eight hectares of wasteland and turn it into productive land following DA business models. It's really not a question of sacrifice. It's not really a question of uh, losing anything. It's uh, not for me uh, a matter of making more money or less money. I have a very comfortable physical and material life and I would like basically to live in a world where everyone else has the same. That's why I do what I do. Professor Mario Molina, winner in 1999, is a world-renowned expert on atmospheric chemistry. In 1995, he won the Nobel Prize for his work in atmospheric chemistry, particularly concerning the formation and decomposition of the ozone. Professor Molina exemplifies what the Sasakawa Prize is all about. He's always had one foot in the lab and one in the world of practical action. His life is dedicated to basing in hard science international measures such as the Montreal Protocol to save the ozone layer. I was born in Mexico City, in this city, um, many years ago. But as a kid, I, I was already fascinated with science. For some reason, um, I enjoyed playing with the uh, microscopes and with the chemistry kits and so on. Uh, even though my father was a lawyer, so out of nowhere, black sheep in the family, I became a scientist rather than keeping up with the family tradition of being a lawyer. But fortunately, I kept this interest in science, uh, this curiosity I think that many kids have about how things work. My dream was to become a scientist to do scientific research for a living. Today, Professor Molina continues to research and is shortly to announce the opening of the Mario Molina Center in Mexico City, a base from which others can continue his work for years to come. What I hope to achieve when the when the center is finished, we will have facilities where we can function towards the goals that we set out for the center, which is to, to really have an impact on, uh, on the way the government uh, implements regulations. To begin with, for uh, air quality issues, but in general issues connected with the use of energy in, in, in such a way that the environment is uh, respected, protected, and so on. Professor Molina's opinions are sought after everywhere he goes in Mexico, and he continues to campaign tirelessly for clean air. There are people that uh, are the 
managing air quality program, so it's important that they exchange information. Okay, so uh, it is very useful to have all these group people in these groups learn from each other, but have an opportunity to create new ways of dealing with their, with their problems. What we want to convey is the idea that we need to improve our quality of life, not just economic development for the sheer uh, purpose of, of uh, improving the economy, but we want to improve the quality of life, and the environment is part of that. In 1974, working with Professor Sherwood Rowland in the laboratories of the University of California, the two scientists discovered that CFCs, then considered the most benign and helpful of chemicals, through a complex chemical reaction, could destroy ozone molecules in the upper atmosphere. The US government moved to ban CFC sprays, but the world had to wait until the almost by chance discovery of the so-called hole in the ozone layer by a British scientist before international action was taken. My first instinct was that I had done something wrong, but this what didn't seem very plausible that human activities could have such consequences. But after checking and rechecking, yeah, it, it did seem uh, that that was to be the case, and that's when I became worried indeed that something could happen. Thanks to these discoveries, the world slowly started to wake up to the fact that human action could imperil the planet. The pair had to wait another 20 years until along with another scientist, Paul Crutzen, they were awarded their Nobel Prize. The Sasakawa Prize followed four years later. I was surprised because it's a prestigious prize and uh, in some sense what one ex often expects is uh, having a Nobel Prize that you will not receive any additional prizes, but uh, that many prizes are indeed very fair and they recognize additional work that uh, people do even after receiving the Nobel Prize. Professor Molina's faculty work continues to this day for the students and researchers he teaches at the National University in Mexico City and those who attend the Mario Molina Center. He remains convinced that policy change must be catalyzed by and rooted in hard science. I believe that this is a process It's beginning to happen, that the, this understanding that, the, that protecting the environment can move along economic development, it's a message that we are uh, being able to, to, to convey and, and people in government at high levels are certainly agreeing with this. Our deep gratitude it is this attempt to change the policies of government that's one of the main driving forces behind the Sasakawa Prize today. There is one thing, one mindset we have to change. Some people think that mankind can control the earth and can control the environment, but I think that is not true. I think that mankind is being given a wonderful opportunity to live together with other creations on this beautiful planet, and I think that politicians have to change their mindset to be able to appreciate this truth. The Tahumuco and Tacana volcanoes on the Guatemala-Mexico border are at the heart of a watershed ecosystem that is almost a million years old. This system is now under severe threat from increasing levels of water pollution caused by the local human population and the coffee industry. In a hopeful sign, the people living in the area are now beginning to realize they must do something to alleviate the damage they have done to their environment. Humanity first fell in love with coffee back in the 9th century in the highlands of Ethiopia. Today, coffee is the second most valuable globally traded commodity after petroleum. It is estimated that 500 billion cups are consumed every year around the world. It's produced by over 20 million farmers worldwide. More than half of the world's coffee farms, 5.8 million hectares, are found here in Central America. 
And it is this industry, so vital to the economy of the region, that is now leading the way in transforming how water and other natural resources are used on these volcanoes. A bit further down the mountainside, between 1,000 to 2,000 meters, are the coffee plantations so vital to this region. It's shortly after dawn and coffee workers in Guatemala are heading to the fields. It's harvest time. For over 100 years, coffee has been at the core of Guatemala's economy and today it generates one third of the country's foreign currency. These pickers are part of the La Igualdad farming community in the shadow of Tacaná volcano. Each day during harvest, the farm produces between two and 7,000 kilos of coffee. Profits are shared out between its 150 owner producers. La Gualdad is spearheading the way coffee farms are now using their most precious resource, water. It used to take three million liters of water to produce the farm's annual harvest of 70,000 kilograms of coffee. But in a remarkable turnaround, La Gualdad now uses only 225,000 litres, a saving of nearly 93%. Farms used to behave very irresponsibly in terms of the environment. We have tried to look at ways of turning this around. This is why we are now working using a totally organic process. This means that we are all now responsible for looking after our environment. They've achieved this turnaround by changing the way they use water, recycling it throughout the entire process. One kilo of coffee is produced by fermenting about five kilos of beans in fresh water a process that generates enormous quantities of a highly polluted acidic coffee wastewater. Farms like La Igualdad have traditionally dumped this toxic wastewater and pulp residue straight back into the rivers. Not anymore. Now in La Igualdad, before water is returned to the river, it is stored in holding tanks to be thoroughly purified. The toxins that contaminate the water are further reduced by growing organic coffee. Conventional coffee is grown with more pesticides than any other agricultural crop. Organic coffee is produced under strict international guidelines without pesticides or fertilizers. The growing global demand for organic and fair trade coffee, where producers are guaranteed returns as cooperative members, is helping these farmers and their environment. Guatemala produces almost 10% of the world's organic coffee, the second highest after its neighbor, Mexico. But the pressures of the coffee industry on the water table only tell part of the story in this region. From the top to the bottom of the mountain, people throw their rubbish into the rivers. At 2,000 meters above sea level, this is the town of Casario Las Pilas. Here, rubbish is thrown directly into the water. Children swim nearby as their mothers wash clothes. Today, community leaders are trying to change people's attitudes. Farming communities in river catchment areas are now organizing themselves in an attempt to find solutions to tackle some of these problems. A tree nursery in Takana was started in May 2007. To date, 13,660 trees have been planted with the aim of replacing those chopped down for firewood. Project leader Lazaro Perez hopes to increase this number to between 30 to 40,000 trees in 2008. 
Fields are ploughed into terraces in an attempt to control the flow of floodwaters, with farmers attempting to find ways of transforming traditional techniques. But the water all heads in one direction, down, and it is at the bottom of these volcanoes where communities are suffering the consequences of erosion, deforestation and pollution created further upstream. And Tropical Storm Stan wreaked havoc amongst communities here. This is the fishing village of Casarillo Fargos, a community of 850 people. Don Leonardo Barrios and other villagers believe Hurricane Stan was an accident waiting to happen and could happen again. On the outskirts of the village, Leonardo shows where a species of water lilies have choked a river tributary. This plant is dangerous for our community. The waters that reach us at the bottom of the mountain are incredibly polluted, with high amounts of phosphorus, fertilizers, calcium and such like. This plant grows because of this and is blocking the river. The water cannot get out. The water should reach the main river to the sea, but the plant blocks it. The danger is that this leads to flooding, which has happened before with hurricanes Mitch and Stan. Leonardo remembers only too well the sudden flooding of the river Suciate, which ran by his house. He and his eight family members managed to escape in time, only to watch their house and all their belongings be washed away in the torrent. Nearby, a mangrove project ensures that any future storm damage from the sea is reduced by the buffering effect of the mangrove trees. What's more, the trees are home to a large variety of fish and prawns, supporting local fishing communities. Mexico produces 20.5% of the world's organic coffee, making it the world's principal supplier. Here in Chiapas, it's so-called shade coffee. The beans are picked amidst the leaves of fruit trees planted to stop erosion. This also favors the development of rich and complex flavors. Shade trees also fix nutrients in the soil. As well as binding the soil, the trees also provide economic benefits to farmers. The advantage of having other produce other than coffee is that we do not depend solely throughout the year on coffee production alone, which is harvested once a year. Having other products, other plantations, other produce gives us an alternative. All across this watershed, there are projects to try and turn around the devastation this region has experienced. Many of the people who live here realize they have a hard task ahead. Foundation, which spends $650 million a year on good causes. Thank you very much. Among the laureates invited to China were Ian Kiernan, winner in 1998, an Australian yachtsman who founded the Clean Up the World campaign in 1993. It's estimated that 150 million have participated in the campaign. Huey Johnson won in 2001 for his work both in NGOs and in local government, promoting the management of natural resources in the state of California. Husband and wife Wolfgang and Francoise Verhenna, it's a keystone of the prize. 
My father always had the belief that the world is a family, one big family, all mankind are brothers and sisters. In fact, he started to say this in 1939. He wrote this in his diary as far back as that. He also said that if you look at our Earth from the universe, we can see a very beautiful planet. No borders, no people fighting, a very beautiful planet. So we must protect it and preserve it. The annual Sasakawa Award of $200,000 makes it one of the world's most valuable environmental prizes. It's backed by the... Beijing. When the Sasakawa Prize was established, bicycles were the main form of transport here. Now, to get to their destination on time, the laureates must get police passage through the gridlock. There's growing alarm in Chinese government circles at the horrendous environmental cost of its economic boom. Hosting the 20th anniversary is an important opportunity to focus attention on green issues and the need to tackle shared problems. The UNEP Sasakawa Prize is one of the world's most important environmental awards. In today's program, we feature two of its laureates. One is a former UN official who quit his high-paying job to go back to his country to provide money-making solutions for the poor. Another is a scientist who was part of a team that first detected a threat to the ozone layer. were joint winners in 1991 for their work in framing international environmental law. Changing mindsets and empowering the poor is what drives Ashok Kosla, winner of the award in 2002, for his work in India providing practical money-making solutions for the poor and needy of his country. I was born in Lahore, an ancient city located in Punjab, which was then in India, but has subsequently become Pakistan. No, I don't think I would say I was uh, born an environmentalist. No, actually, I was a refugee. I had to move out of Srinagar and Kashmir at about an hour's notice when the uh, Pakistan Army.